shall i start yes sir the honorable panelist for appearing on the screen online participants for accessing this event through zoom conferencing rooms and the worldwide viewers who are watching us through youtube live on our channel from different corners of the world a very good afternoon and greetings from smu udgir maharashtra india i welcome all of you to the second eighth session of today international online conference on the role of literature in the time of crisis like coronavirus pandemic organized in collaboration with srdm university nanded friends literature has a healing effect upon its readers apocalyptic outbreak of diseases have always been a recurring motif in literature since the earth existed many writers have tried to depict the human encounter with natural disaster epidemics and other calamities epidemics and pandemics are humanitarian crises and hence it has been the subject of the humanities and literature we must know and understand the literature written in past of pandemic and its social purpose of saving and guiding the humanity in the time of crisis for example the plague by albert camus a 90 a 1947 novel by camus is about a plague epidemic that ravages a quarantined city in algeria for two days covid 19 affected humanity this novel is like a mental and psychological antidote it is a novel that can help us think about what we are expressing us well as it that can help to heal the humanity to explore such two text with reference to present crisis today in this session we have dr shailaja wadikar professor department of english srdm university nanded who will talk on her topic epidemic inquiry in badal sirkar's theater we have dr yunis phonyu fondes fombele senior lecturer department of english from university of bua cameroon who will talk on her topic narrative ethics in the pandemic time an exploration of kalin dayan aish the earth in peril and uh, we have in fact dr gandhi has a problem he just he communicated me about uh, the internet uh, connectivity uh, that's why today's session will be chaired by uh, professor dr smita naguri professor and head department of english uh, maharashtra udaygiri college udgir uh, and she will join shortly within couple of minutes i would like to start with our first speaker dr shailaja wadikar dr wadikar as i told you is a professor uh, department of english as well as he is a director of school of languages literature and culture study of our parent university that is srt university nanded she specializes in phonetics linguistics and indian theater she has a good number of books and many research papers chapters and plenary talks to her credit she has worked as a member of the senate and he has is also on board of study of english with me as my senior colleague there she has completed three major research project projects of ugc new delhi i request her to start her talk dr wadikar sir madam please at the very outset i thank uh, dr navlin sir who is my brother and the coordinator uh, of this uh, mega event uh, the principal of the college um, yunis ma'am and uh, the chairperson uh, dr nagori uh, before going to start uh, reading my paper i want to say something from march 2020 we have been listening to a sentence continuously that we have to fight against the disease and not the disease striker people we have to feel sympathy love affinity for them and such type of suggestions are there because we observe that in alienated from society uh, that is the theme of majority of the plays of badal sarkar exploitation of um, the peasants by the landlords the villages by the cities the developing countries by the developed countries these are the themes alienation of man from society and exploitation of all those things from the of the smaller one from the uh, mighty one 
these are the themes of this place here i am going to depict three place uh, because the time constraints are there one is evam indrajit second one is uh, baki ityas and third one is the sheshne uh, i am going to start the paper with a quotation from baki ityas no no one can do anything operation murder violence war will continue all carried out by man but still there is nothing man can do the very man who is content with his two meals a day will stab another the same scientist who cannot bear to see an animal in pain will invent a weapon of mass destruction these are all men like you like me they have all tried to find a meaning in life in order to carry on striving throughout his theatrical career sarkar tries to use theater as a means of social reform writing of a play and its performance is a wish from him about it he says to go out in the theater and come back and report talk to others about it talk to myself about it go out again with others to others learn to speak to others learn to listen to others try out things learn by doing so feels badal sarkar one of the major indian playwrights the pioneer of people's theater this is the line he accepted once and forever in creation of his theater to make theater reach to common man is his sole aim as a playwright and successfully he flows homewards his very will theater for him become the abode that has accommodated his cherished talent and aspirations and to which he has devoted his entire life to actualize his dream of establishing a just human and equitable society sarkar is the leader of theater world in fact since he calls upon people to go hand in hand to discuss the current issues to write a script to make an ample use of human body as the most effective tool in presentation to have a rigorous training and practice too and finally to perform a play without the expectation of monetary gain he is a playwright director yes here is teacher mentor and social activist having visions and revisions the beacon he showed changed the theater goers conventional sensibility of perceiving the play to change the world into a place worth of living was the sole motto of badal sarkar sir throughout his life he worked calmly quietly patiently tirelessly but confidently in the decided direction he is not under the illusion that the disparity in life can be removed simply to theater however he firmly believes that theater can be one of the many facets of a movement that is vitally needed to bring about expected revolution for sarkar if theater is used as a means of social reform communication should not be one sided that is what generally happens in the case of majority of the play instead it should be a joint venture a constant flow of view and take and sharing of ideas between theater makers and the spectators with this aim in mind he walks constantly with people encouraging them to actively participate in the performance of the play this is the people's theater in the true sense of that word sarkar devoted all his energies to the cause of social reform the establishment of egalitarian society was his dream which finds manifestation in his play beyond the land of adam it is a human society where all people lead life following the marxian principle of combined efforts each according to his need each according to his capacity the horrible effects of atom bomb used in the second world war have been responsible to change badal sarkar's perspective on the altered existence of middle class living with its prescribed narrative of birth education and career marriage procreation death in an unbroken loop this horror of war ultimately makes him lead from the proscenium to the non proscenium theater sarkar firmly believes that the change in the mindset of people will certainly bring about a revolution in society so he is a propagandist and uses theater as a means of social reform to develop his theater as people theater he successfully tries to make it less expensive from the point of view of audiences similarly from the point of view of performances as well siboji bandyapadhyay observes a direct connection between the nuclear criticism and sarkar's adoption of the third theater he states i quote i strongly feel that badal sarkar's move toward the third theater would not have taken place if his reflection on death and disaster had not widened the memory of hiroshima day and the terrifying disaster 
which would not only be the final and fullest extension of every cruelty and viciousness, but also the annihilation of every possibility of justification or condemnation, haunts many Bhagavad-Sarkar themes and fortune. The group of the play, Tevon Indrajit, Sakhi Ibihas, and Sheshni, is the output of Sarkar's contemplation over the third world countries. Each of them deals with the cruel absurdities of life, aspirations, and frustration of the ruthless urban generation, man's indifference and carelessness to his environment that is going more and more critical, and so on. Sarkar represents an individual alienated from society who remains largely responsible for the present situation, which is increasingly becoming hostile. Vina Nugelda's advice, a lifelong nagging reminder of guilt, can be the only consolation for the Indrajits, Sharats, and Sumantas who are too sensitive and individualistic to choose any path of action to put an end to Hiroshima. Unquote. With Eva Indrajit, Sarkar becomes famous in Indian theatrical, theatrical circles. It is the publication and performance of this play that theatre practitioners all over India become aware of the major talent. The play proves for him a shock of recognition. It is about the Indian reality as they know it. The angry and frustrated protagonist of the play, Indrajit, he is the true representative of the misfit of the prevailing social order. In his protest against the society, the audiences find the realities of their lives. The protagonist of the play, who is actually Nirmal, considers himself from the others, that is, Amal, Vimal, and Kamal. He rejects to follow the beaten track of the middle class people in society, considering himself as Indrajit. Amal, Vimal, and Kamal willingly become the fox in the wheels and consequently being with the current flourish not Being different from them, Indrajit isolates himself from the norms of society and rejected the pleasures and happiness that the world offers him and further resists becoming a cop in the wheel as long as he can. He loves Manzi, wants to marry her. His cousin on mother's side goes to London with the thought that his visit will liberate him from the boring existence and banality of life, but at the end realizes that he is not different from the others and life remains the same whether one is abroad or in India. He fails to follow the dictum, best not till the goal is achieved, and he cannot keep himself lingering behind the fact that there is always a room for the term. In his desperate, frantic effort to find meaning of existence, he gets exhausted. Ultimately, he flows towards his very way, since to toss from side to side on the slippers bed now becomes impossible for him. His failure in committing suicide makes him realize the harsh and deniable reality of life, that being a tiny particle of this vast cosmos, he has to continue his painful journey on the endless road, since we are the cursed spirit of this person. Satyadev Dubey is quite justified in pointing out, I quote, writing about Badal Sarkar Tegom Indrajit is like going on a sentimental journey, an encounter with the bitter sweet memories of the struggling sensibility, trying, trying to strike roots in the barren land. Unquote. Like Indrajit, Indrajit, like Be Beckett's Budo, is an eternal question mark, but Beckett ends his play at waiting while Sarkar is determined to continue searching. The play Baki Ibihas seems to be the sequel of the earlier play Eva Indrajit, with the difference that Indrajit accepts the foible of existence, with, while Sitana demands responsibility on the part of the audiences. Sarkar writes it in Nigeria in 1964-65. It is the seventh month in the series of his plays. The question raised by Indrajit, what justifies middle-class man's existence, become a lament for the protagonist of Baki Ibihas. Anjum Katiyal opines, I quote, like the predecessor Eva Mindrajit and Sari Rast, it deals with the inadequacies and stultifying banality of middle class routine, paradicated against the call of larger life outside. What about the rest of history? The Baki Ithihas is the anguished cry that paints the play. And so, so, here Sarkar again exhumes and exposes the absurdity of the contemporary society and challenges the existence of man in the present war ridden scenario. The play explores the guilt consciousness of the middle class man for being indifferent to the social condition and his responsibility. Baki Ithihas revolves around the three different versions of the story that have the same ending. The protagonist Sharath and his wife Vasanti appear in all the three versions as Sitanath and Kanam, while other the character other characters remain changing. Actually, the stories represent the different states of mind of a common man. 
a headline in a newspaper stimulates Sharad and Vasanti. What begins as an intellectual exercise soon morphs into a stifling commentary on mankind's selfish, complacent existence and on his darkest thought, the kind that drives him to write those pages of human history that were best left unwritten. The play opens with the protagonist Sharad, a college professor, and his wife Vasanti, a writer. A news album that describes the suicide of a person named Sitana attracts their attention, feeling that the dead person has a slightly known acquaintance. They try to case the cause of his suicide. The analysis of Sitana's death from three different dimensions forms the plot of the play. Vasanti thinks bankruptcy and alienation to be the causes of his suicide, wherein the conflict arises due to the priority given to the financial security by Sitana's wife, Panak, who has hailed from her father's wife and home. She is incapable of distinguishing between the security offered by the material world and the sustained soul steering company offered by her husband. Shara's anti anticipation about the same is quite shocking and complicated. In his story, he projects Sitana suffering from Lolita fixation, a grown up man having obsessed with a desire to have sex with an immature girl. The story ends with Sitana committing suicide by strangling himself as a penance for his past death and as a gesture of preventing the repetition in future time. Sitana's ghost is the protagonist of the third version of the story. His interpretation of man's history is a stunning revulsion of the mystery to Sharad. This encounter reveals to Sharad the depressing and desolate side of the history of mankind referred to as that remaining history or that other history. In his view, Sitana enacts as the role of the agent of an inhuman tradition. Contemplating in this way, he begins to brood over the absurdity of his existence. The playwright here condemns the indifference of man, his alienation from society, which makes him blind to the predicament of the fellow being in the so-called civilized third world country. The play begins to notice the fact that material success and love for power lead man nowhere but towards war and oppression. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Innocent people become the victim of war due to their tendency of blindly following the orders of their master and also due to their incapacity to stop it. And the middle class people like Sitana, Sharad, and Vasanti are either unaware of this other side of history or turn to live here today while criticizing, criticizing the middle class mentality. Anjum Patiyal remarks, I hope this play intensifies the central concern of Eva Mindrajit by asking the question, why should a middle class subject not commit suicide but justify his continued existence, his modest measured pleasures, the reassurance of his domestic routine, his steady rise to the rank of his profession, are this enough to block out the violence and injustice that regains in that other history and hope. The unveiling of the other side of, the, of that reality for the protagonist, who is the representative of a middle class, is the revulsion which shudders his entire existence. Like the Avagat Lerai, Sarkar sets out to let something new, to shock the sensibility of his reader and to make them conscious of the fact that their indifference and do-nothing policy are largely responsible for present creating condition of the world they are living in. The play projects various sides of history of mankind. One side of history comprises violence, bloodshed, mass destruction, the victories of the emperors, kings, heroes, the history full of riots and war, and Hitler and Hiroshima and so on. It is observed that injustice done to man by man has not stopped or reduced. On the contrary, it is continued on a larger scale with magnified violence. Another side has those faceless people on whose shoulders the heroes put their guns and created the records of their achievement. There is still one more side of history which comprises a common man with his conventional monotonous routine with day-to-day -day concerns and with a disregard for the other side of history. Towards the end of the play is the beginning of the audience's consciousness. They are they are left perplexed. The play's protagonist makes them introspective to this untold other side of history. Sitana seems to, to be a minute microcosm of those faceless pop whose names are unknown to history. The realization of the absurdity of his existence inside seems to come to side. Sharing a burden of the knowledge of the other history, his conscience does not allow him to live a life of contention. He is left to suffer the agony of living with the consciousness of being the part of the world which is full of flowing 
His plight is similar to that of the people of Canterbury in murder in the cathedral, stating, "Yet, we have gone on living, living, and partly living on food." He is at once searching for security in the midst of annihilation and admits his responsibility for the crime of humanity. But it does not lead to any action or change from his addiction to routine life. Sarkar stops with raising the conscience of the onlooker, leaving the subsequent relevant action in the hands of the individual themselves. The structure of the play is experimental. The first two acts deal with the two versions of the story behind secret suicide. The third act explores the various states of mind of the protagonist, in one of which he really tries to commit suicide. The motivation for suicide is not the personal tragedy, but the total apathy of the middle class with the dark side of the story. The class depicted in the play is white color movie. One that is such a own milieu with its blinkered existence. In the earlier play, the process of politicization was begun with a questioning and refusal to confront. Here, the demand is more intense. Has the choice to be between action or suicide? Is the domestic middle class round of daily existence a denial of reality? Whereas action intervention was not even a possibility for the protagonists of A. Bhumindraji, who were struggling merely to find a reason to carry on. The subject in Baki Tias faces the harsh choice between his personal everyday routine and demands of a other violent history. Is suicide the only option? Then, for the aware of middle class subject, Father Da is continuing to move over the questions of the literate middle class subject and his ability for action or heroism. The play ends with producing guilt in each of the audiences who are left to ponder over the situation. See that Padal Sarkar is the theater of conscience. While so coming to the conclusion, I'm speaking about Sheshnay. The play Sheshnay can be seen as a prelude to Sarkar shift from Prosenian to non prosenian It marks the beginning of the question that has put forth through its third theater for the audiences to think over, to make them introspective, to bring reformation in their thinking mood. Studying the play from this perspective, Uttam Bharata states, I quote, though he has uh, diverted considerably from the dramatic structure and characterization of the proceeding work, Sarkar continues to return to the same question that he has raised in Sheshni and Bhakitya. What is the responsibility of the middle class man to the pervasive terror and injustice of this world? What is the role of the individual in collective action? How does one make another person confront his or her guilt without in some way concealing one's own? These are difficult questions which Sarkar continues to grapple with in his experience. Exploration of the third theater and two. Shesh Nai, written in 1970, extends the theme of earlier play Bhakti Itiya, that is the theme of guilt, consciousness, and responsibility through the character of Sumantha, the play protagonist. Sumantha is the representative of the educated middle class people of the contemporary society. The play is actually just like looking within our inner self. Sarkar highlights this search of inner self by creating a dream like setting indicated on stage by a dim lighting. He successfully explored the unfathomable depth of human psyche, so it is a voyage to the subconscious. The play presents a trial without a judge. Using this technique, the playwright seems to suggest that we ourselves are the judges, best judges of our deeds in the trial of law. At the subconscious level, each of us is engaged in the activity of evaluating and judging ourselves. That is why the play is with all the characters saying, we are the accused. Manta's journey from the accused to the judge is very significant. It makes sense in the context of time. His declaration and acceptance at the end of the play and accused publicly symbolizes his search for himself as well as his recognition of self guilt. To avoid the repetition of the past, this transition is this transition is a must. The past here has a limited relevance in the sense that it is not continued to the present situation of other things. The consciousness in time makes for an ever renewed present. In the trial, therefore, there is always a new beginning and the trial can never end. Looking into the past, we have to take correct decisions at the present to show the result in future time and there will be no repetition of our detail. This is possible only when we ourselves are the judges of our actions, seems to say the playwright in the garb of the protagonist. 
टू कंक्लूड द डिस्कशन इन द वर्ड्स ऑफ खालिद जमाने में उसने बड़ी बात कर ली उससे ही जिसने मुलाकात कर ली दैट इज इट इज अ ग्रेट अचीवमेंट ऑन पॉइंट पार्ट इफ वन रिकॉग्नाइज हिमसेल्फ टू इफ वी रिकॉग्नाइज आवर सेल्फ एंड इफ वी रिकॉग्नाइज आवर ड्यूटीज टू अवर सोसाइटी वी कैन डेफिनेटली फाइंड द कैलामिटीज लाइक कोविड-19 एंड सक्सेसफुली कंट्रीब्यूट to the establishment of a just human equality thank you professor dr shailaja wadikar ma'am uh dr smita nagori lakhotia just recently joined it is my duty to welcome her and introduce her uh, to the participants and uh, the vast audience dr smita ar nagori lakhotia is a professor and head at post graduate department and research center in english maharashtra udaygiri mahavidyalaya udaygiri district lato she was iqc and nac coordinator also as iqc and nac coordinator she is instrumental in bagging a grade to her college she specializes in indian english literature in general and indian english drama in particular she has many publications many talks many book chapters to her credit she has participated in number of uh, national international literary events conferences seminars also and apart from this she is also working for society with her husband who is a doctor by profession and social worker by passion i welcome dr uh, sr naguri and now i would like to turn towards the uh, our second speaker our second speaker is dr Unis from Cameroon. Uh, she is working as a senior lecturer, also as a research head, uh, Department of English, University of Goa, Cameroon. She too has a good number of research papers, chapters, talks to her credit. And now I request Dr. Unis. One thing I would like to note that to mention here that Dr. Unis is watching and accessing this conference since the first very session. She is present to all sessions. I am thankful toward her. Dr. Unis, please start your talk. Unmute your microphone. Yeah. Yeah, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nawale. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, all the panelists. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful to the team. My topic of uh, presentation is narrative ethics in the time of pandemics, and I'm doing an exploration. of Collins IS the F in Harry I'm arguing that literature has boosted humanity and has assisted in the understanding of being and transformation of society for millennia but the importance of interpreting and reinterpreting and understanding pandemic culture through literature needs specific emphasis especially at this time that the world is witnessing an unknown deadly virus like the corona virus am i are you getting me yes okay thank you yes yes you are audible carry on okay okay thank you we are saying that we uh, the culture of the pandemic culture has always been with mankind but and writers have pictured the past the present and the future of pandemic culture but literary critics and readers have not given pandemic culture the attention it deserves and that is why covid-19 came as a surprise to us So we are arguing that in the midst of trials and tribulations triggered by a pandemic like COVID-19, narratives can provide humankind with ethical reasons to interpret and reinterpret and understand human nature in relation to moral judgment and pandemic culture. So the Earth in Peril. published in Cameroon in 2010 by a Cameroonian budding writer Colin Dien Ayen 
reverberate more forcefully as a narrative piece with a mode of engagement that raises different kinds of ethical concerns about human moral agency and values in the context of pandemic culture. So what is, what is narrative ethics? Paul Ricoeur has uh, said that a narrative is the synthesis of the heterogeneous. It is a capacity to redescribe reality by combining elements disposed in time and space into some kind of coherent pattern. In defining a narrative this way, Rico reverts to Aristotle's notions of employment and mimesis in the poetics. And, and these are the double roles of narrative. Narrative, the double role played by narrative reveals the relationship between ethics and narratives. In recurrent terms, therefore, while ethics express the link between veto and the pursuit of happiness, narrative furnishes the readers with specific ways of imagining how the moral aspects of human behavior may be linked with happiness and unhappiness, wellness and unwellness. So the Earth Imperial provides readers critics with particular ways of understanding pandemic culture and interpreting how it could be linked to human to humankind's predicament and also particularly opens humanity to the way forward in the midst of pandemics of pandemics. Uh, James Phelan has said that narratives Narrative ethics explores the intersection between the domain of stories and storytelling and that of moral values. Narrative ethics regards moral values as an integral part of stories and storytelling because narratives themselves uh, implicitly or explicitly ask the question, how should one think, judge, and act as author, narrator, character, audience, or reader for the greater good, for the greater good of humanity. So Anya, as the author, through the techniques of narration and the happenings in the novel, manifestly conveys certain feelings and emotions readers about moral values and ethical choices. And this perspective, in this perspective, the reader's interpretation and evaluation of pandemic culture as captured in the Earth in peril through the narrators, the characters, and other elements that make up the totality of it as a novel are influenced to a great extent by the ethical, ethical values communicated in the narrative. And Anya's uh, targeted resolution is engraved in the very acts of narration or storytelling suggests, and his, the, his, the way he tells his story suggests an ethical significance. That is how we saw he, uh, his story as a narrative ethical story. So the ethical creative and, inter, in, and interpretive narrative process of the earth in peril can be identified through three uh, the threefold recurrent mimesis, the prefiguration, the configuration, and the refiguration. Uh, the mimetic creative process, as Ricoeur conceives of it in time and narrative, encompasses a prefigured time that becomes a refigured time through the mediation of a configured time. So in recurrent terms, Pandemic culture is the prefiguration of the earth in Peru. That is what provoked Anya to conceive and construct the narrative is the culture 
of pandemic that has been affecting Dr. mankind be for millennia. Dr. Yunis, please be concise. We have dearth of time, please. Put in short. Okay, okay please. Because a very big event, very trees uh, uh, following after this session. Okay. Put so uh, when we look at the novel, from the perspective of characters, we realize that the reader's interpretative competence gives answers to some questions. As Aye creates a convincing alternative world, the world of Mongongo, whose characters are and stories symbolize the mirror through which the people of the earth see and examine their predicaments. The people of the earth are the patient whose story needs to be listened to and the gaps and rupture in their life story identified for the proper healing process to be engaged. So at the superficial level of the narrative, the story seems to be that of the Mongongo. But it, the Mongongo is used as metaphor to represent the usually unknown sources of pestilences on culture, uh, 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 and the moral judgments and choices the, the earthlings do face and with social panic. So the reader becomes firmly grounded in the issues surrounding pandemic culture in their world as they read the story of uh, King Awobia of Mongongo and his people. Centering on plot, the reader identifies what expectations and surprises the story creates as the narrative progresses. You realize that the story identifies various types of pestilences and pandemics that have existed uh, in the world. And the story projects that it is the people of Mongongo who wants to take over the world, who have been programming and introducing these uh, pestilences and, and pandemics and uh, atomic bombs to the world. And so the world has been experiencing this culture of pandemics. So two parallel aspects of narrative uh, understanding, narrative understanding and practical wisdom of moral ju judgment come out as we read the novel. The Earth in Perry helps the narrator and the readers to reflect on how the Earth got to the peril of pandemic culture and how it should move from there. And it moves to the question of how the Earth should move from there with reassurance. I read this quote from the, from the novel. The earthlings who had been going about their normal business, obvious of anything, of any looming danger, were not prepared for such a virulent killer when the fire plague struck with full force. Nobody thought that rats could be linked to it. After all, the bubonic plague that swept uh, through Europe hundreds of years ago had been tamed and mastered. Uh, the quotation demonstrates that the earthlings the people of the earth had experienced a lot of pandemics uh, hundreds of years, millennia back, and they have succeeded to repress and understand them. But the reader is presented with uh, characters who are in the midst of serious rupture, like the one we are experiencing today, where a massive offensive is launched again. <laughs> And the virulent nature of, uh, of the plague and the social panic it creates is aptly, is aptly captured in the following words. Carry on, carry on, please. The fire plague did not discriminate and, uh, and it swept away every human obstacle it came across. Popers, sportsmen, doctors, ministers, presidents, no one was paid. The earth's population was actually disappearing. The religious had offered or participated in special prayers to rid the earth of fire plague. Quake doctors and fortune tellers had made wild predictions and speculations in vain. So we, we realize that Aristotle's uh, Peripite best describes this type of sudden reversal of expectation that 
is witnessed in the earth in peril and that we are witnessing in the world today. So identifying and knowing how the peripheral has occurred and is occurring at this moment in life of the earthling is essential for grasping the value of the story or culture of pandemics. It is also essential for comprehending how the people of the earth start recognizing how they might go on from the uncertainty they find themselves in as more in, in, in they find themselves in as they search for assurances in their life. So in this process, many assumptions came, come up as to among the people about the source of the pestilences and so on. But as an ethical narrative piece, the earth in peril unveils some flaws about the earth that if not corrected fast, may take the world down the drain. And these negative points are revealed through uh, the Mongo Mongongo scientists as they discuss the ingenuity of their projects and as they project the reasons why the earthlings or the people of the earth should be eliminated from the surface of the earth. I quote from the novel, with all this abundance and easy life, humans are still very stingy and selfish. They still want to conquer each other and have everything. One group is talking about communism where they claim there will be an almost equal distribution of wealth yet they have ended up with a privileged class. The it's others it's prefer to it, yeah. Please so, conclude, Dr. Lokote, ma'am, please remind her to conclude. Um, Sorry. Ma'am, Eunice, ma'am, I request you to conclude it because we are out of time and we are yeah. running short of time. Yeah. Okay. I request you to conclude. Put, put the Maybe things within, minutes, within one minute. Yeah, in a nutshell. Okay. Okay. You are there also in very literary. There, there. I, I will give you your time because it, it will close. It has time restrictions. Okay. There you okay. Well, we are saying that uh, as readers, we find a sense of an opening out that reads a new uh, part of the story just beginning at the end of the narrative, and um, we have a resolution that occurs in the end of the story when the pandemic narrative thread is winning to the background as a new humanity is finding itself mainly in uh, deriving its vigor from the African leaders proposal who says that we should unite, the world should unite and work as one against the enemy. So by carefully listening to the people, uh, a, the, to the story, the reader begins to recognize what matters to their moral world as they face the challenge of pestilences and bombing attacks. So the reader's moral energy is focused on compassion, aiming to understand how the earthlings might choose the best way to go forward at this moment in their lives when they are suffering from a, a pandemic like uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Let me just uh, end here since uh, we don't have time. I had 20 minutes, but I'm not sure I'm used up to 10. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, let me uh, first of all congratulate uh, my both the speakers, that is Professor Wadikar and Professor Yunis for their excellent presentations. Professor Wadikar has talked about theater the, through Badal Sirka, that how it was instrumental in reforming and especially the internal part where uh, the alienation part has to be, uh, you know, uh, come out or change the man side of the people. And Dr. Yunus also has focused that how one group during this pandemic talks about humanistic approach and where the other group is adverse in its nature. Uh, with these two scholarly presentations, I thank both the uh, presenters and I also thank the organizer of this uh, international conference, Professor Navle, for giving me an opportunity and listening to this wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Dr. Lakhopia, madam, for presiding uh, over this session. And uh, you are always with our department, uh, with us uh, since yes, uh, a decade, uh, two decades. I'm thankful toward you especially. And Thank Dr. You, uh, madam, also thankful to you. And Eunice, Dr. Eunice, thanks. And you have to join in validity also. You are supposed to join uh, I, for the preparation of the next session. 
uh, I am now closing this session. Thank you. Namaste to all. Thank you. Namaste. Yeah, namaste.